Now, for my first trick, what did we say we were going to do? Your time has come, old man. I'm here to collect it. Ah, but fucking Retta. Well, now let me see here. First thing you have to ask yourself, audience, young and old, see, how come you work your way out of television, you work your way all the way up to In Cold Blood and Electric Light and yada, 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 and then you wind up doing Beretta. People do television on their way up, or they do it on their way down. They don't do it while they're on top. Like, Peter Falk became a movie star. Then his career started falling off, so he went and he did Columbo, which put him back on the map, and he went and made some more movies. I could name you a dozen people like that. Robert Wagner was a uh, movie star, big, 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 big time movie star. Career started falling off, went to television, and stayed there. So how come this busted up old dumb cowboy, well, we have to back up. I was the little rascals and all that stuff. Went in the army, went to Alaska, almost wound up in Leavenworth for life. But God reached in and pulled my shoulder out. Got out, went back to work, falling off horses for a living, and whatever I could get. I had some friends, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, people that I had worked with at Republic when I was doing Little Beaver in the Red Rider show, which I'm sure is boring as hell to you as it is to me. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes, toot, toot. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes, toot, toot. She'll be coming round the mountain, she'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes, toot, toot. She'll be driving six white horses when she comes, whoa. They gave me some jobs. I worked, uh, Roy Rogers gave me a couple of shows, uh, Gene Autry gave me a show. So I started working again. Pretty soon I got some dialogue. Okay, now I work my way up. And I go to some very good acting, I won't call them teachers because they're better than that. They deal with you emotionally, not out of a book. This is how you act, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and Brian Hutton was one of those people. Jeff Corey was another one of those people. And uh, I was doing, I'd worked my way up to doing pretty good shows. You know, like some of the top shows uh, gun smoke, have gun, will travel, stuff that you guys don't know anything about unless you're 9,000 years old. All right, Nathan, we'll, uh, see each other again, huh? We'll find out who gets the last laugh. Anyway, I was doing a show uh, with my friend Vince Edwards, who was uh, Mr. Universe, and it was called Ben Casey. My friend Vince Edwards got me a job on Ben Casey, where I'm playing a uh, Juby Delink, a Mexican kid who was on the wrong side of the tracks. And uh, he's in there with handcuffs on in the emergency room because the cops had beat him up a little bit, some herring handcuffs. 
and sitting next to me is another guy and all these people in the emergency room and uh, sitting right here next to me is this uh, very strange looking interesting man and he's got his chest is pushed out to here and he talks very very quietly and kind of interesting me and the nurse comes up to me and says uh what's wrong with you and i say uh, what's wrong with me baby is that you got your clothes on and if you take them off i'll show you a good time and she says no wise remarks what's wrong with you i say well the cops blah 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 then she goes to the next guy and he's got his you know, here and she says what's wrong with you he says ah I stabbed myself with an ice pick. This guy's nuts. And she said, uh, was it rusty? He said, I don't know. Well, she said, didn't you look at it? He said, well, I could look at it, but it's right here. He still had the ice pick stuck in his shoulder. <laughs> So the nurse says, no, don't pull it out, let's get a doctor to you. In the meantime, uh, he and I, as actors, are making friends. And this turns out to be Struther Martin. And Struther Martin became my dearest, closest friend right up until the day he died. I loved him with all my heart. I don't think I had three friends in my life. Truman was certainly a friend. I had one friend in high school. He used to let me come and hide at his house when the kids who wanted to tease little beaver would look for me. He let me hide in his house. His name was Keith Crowley. Anyway, Struther and I became very, very fast, close, friends. In the meantime, I got married. So they said, don't do that. Why? He said, you should never marry anybody because you're crazy. <laughs> he was right. If I married a rock, I'm sure I would have screwed up the, the marriage. I was just, I'm crazy. Uh, along with using too much dope and alcohol and the rest of that shit. Anyway, Struther and I become friends. Now, we're getting to Beretta. Uh, I'm still working, and I do the play with Gavin McLeod. The connection, get big reviews from that, and uh, Dick Boone started hiring me on uh, Have Gun Will Travel, and he gave me two or three jobs, four or five jobs. I did quite a few of those. Then he did a thing called the Richard Boone Repertory Company, which was six women and six men who were going to come together and do one season of repertory. We were going to do 24 episodes and we were going to play all the parts.
Well, it was a great idea. And all of the really good writers and the really good directors came in and said, we want to do this because we're sick of doing to week to week same same shows. I mean, if you direct one uh, Dr. Kildare, you've directed 900 Dr. Kildares because they're all the same. The directors get bored with doing that. So they all jumped aboard and we're going to do this series. And uh, one of the guys who jumped aboard immediately was um, Clifford Odets. And uh, he liked my acting a lot. So he started writing shows for me. He wrote a boxer show, which was very much like uh, the boxer show that he wrote that made uh, John Garfield wanted to play the part, but he couldn't, he didn't get the part. Who got the part? William Holden got the part. He wasn't very good in it. John Garfield would have been a lot better. Uh, anyway, we're doing these shows. In the meantime, over here, Truman Capote is writing In Cold Blood. And uh, Truman Capote sold uh, the book that he wrote about the hooker, uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. And he saw the movie and hated it because it was in Technicolor and it was about, uh, supposed to be about a hooker, but they hired the wrong girl to play the hooker because she was just too beautiful and she wouldn't play a hooker. She tried to play a hooker, but she just couldn't. It wasn't in her nature to be a hooker. And they hired this beautiful guy, George Peppard. And her boyfriend was not supposed to be beautiful. He was supposed to be her pimp. So anyway, Truman said, no more of that. I'm taking over. I'm going to be involved in this movie in cold blood from one end to the other. No Technicolor, none of those things. And they tried to force uh, Paul Newman and Steve McQueen on him as the two heavies. And Truman said, I'm taking the material back from you. So Truman picked Richard Brooks. He had seen some picture that Richard made, which was a black and white. Oh, I th oh yeah, it was the... Uh, it was a very good movie that introduced Sidney Poitier. It was a movie uh, about a teacher in a tough school. Truman loved the movie because it was a street movie and it was black and white and it was really special. And um, so Truman kept getting involved with that movie and said, I think that's the guy who's going to direct my picture. They got together and they cast the picture and they cast Carradine as Dick Hickok and they cast who was McQueen's best friend but he was in all of McQueen's movies and they hired him and uh, John Carradine, not John Carradine, what was his first name? I don't care what his first name was. Uh, he had a press conference announcing that he was going to be in In Cold Blood. And Richard Brooks said, no, you're not going to be in Cold Blood, you're fired. Because the press conference made Brooks very unhappy. He wanted to keep this movie in a very low profile. And in the meantime, Gene Simmons, Richard Brooks's wife, saw some of the Richard Boone Repertory Company and uh, she saw two or three episodes that I was in and she told her husband, you got to see this guy. So the husband ran two or three episodes 
that I starred in. One was a boxer that the writer wrote just for me. He wrote two or three shows. So I didn't know anything about any of this. And I had a friend called Sammy Reese, sweet, sweet, sweet man. And he came over to my house one day with Life Magazine. And in Life Magazine were excerpts from In Cold Blood. Uh, the uh, June Capote had some kind of deal with Life Magazine that they wrote excerpts from this thing. And uh, so um, Sammy Reese came over and said, Robert, you're going to play this part. I said, Sammy, what are you talking about? He said, you're going to play this part. And uh, it turned out that he was right. Uh, Richard saw the shows and he said he wanted to test me. And uh, at that time I weighed about 135 pounds. And so I wasn't, you know, what uh, Perry Smith was supposed to be. And so uh, Richard Boone's assistant director took a liking to me, Tommy Shaw. And he said, you're going to come in and you're going to test. Wear two or three sweatshirts and then put a leather jacket on and button it up. And don't unbutton that jacket for the whole screen test. And uh, Sammy Reese said, Robert, you're going to bring your guitar to that screen test and you're going to sing Perry Smith's songs. So I learned Perry's favorite song was, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day long. In a small cafe, the park across the way, the children's carousel. So I played that song and I did the screen test. So now I get the part. And I had already, so they fired uh, McQueen's best friend and they hired me. And I had seen what happened to Cass, to uh, to the other guy who got fired when he when he announced that he was in the movie. So I didn't talk to anybody. I locked up my house, and my house was hermetically sealed. You couldn't get in there with a cannon. And I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't do anything. I went to Vince's gym, and. Uh, Vince Gironda turned out to be the biggest fan that I ever had in my life because all he had in his gym was a lot of bodybuilders. And when I told him what I was in there for, he took personal responsibility for me. And my weight went up to 150 pounds in no time at all. He had me pushing weights. I couldn't believe the weights he had me pulling. And he had me taking steroids and this and that and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so now we do In Cold Blood. Now I have a wife and I have two kids and I have a down payment on a house. And I need to work all the time. I'm working television, I'm working whatever I can work. And I got a part in Paul Newman's movie, He's in Prison, Cool Hand Luke. I got the part of playing Dog Boy in Cool Hand Luke. And I signed a contract, and I think I was going to get $650 a week, which would pay all the bills and get me out of debt and everything. And Richard Brooks found out about it. And he... Uh, he said, you can't, uh, that's not going to be a very good thing. And I said, I got a wife and two kids in a house. Now, I had already signed to do In Cold Blood for $20,000. And uh, Scott Wilson was going to get the same thing. The budget was very low, very, very, very low. So I said, 
I got to support my family. And they said, well, how much does it cost you a month? And I said, I don't know, $600 a month for the house, this, that, whatever else. And they said, okay, you're getting $20,000 for the movie. We're going to loan you money. We can't give you any more than 20000 because Scott Wilson is in at 20000 and this and everybody else is in for short money. But we'll loan you money. I said, okay. Well, as it turned out, my involvement with In Cold Blood lasted for two years. The first six months, I didn't work on In Cold Blood, I didn't work on anything, and they loaned me $600 a month or whatever it was to pay my bills. So by the time In Cold Blood was finished, I was in debt, and uh, I had to go to work, and uh, there was a movie called Willy Boy, I think, yeah, I think it was Willy Boy, and they had already signed an actor for, to play the part, very nice guy, very, very nice guy, he just died. So I got Willy Boy through some very devious means. It was directed by a genius, but he was an old genius. And we were working down in Palm Springs at 120, 130 degrees. And it was uh, Abraham Polanski who directed my favorite movie of all time with John Garfield, Body and Soul. And uh, so I was anxious to get in there. But the heat and the so forth didn't make for a very good movie. Now, Catherine Ross and Robert Redford were in it, but they didn't care a hell of a lot either because they'd both been signed to do Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid right after that so all they want to do is get through that movie and get the hell out so i think i got fifty thousand dollars for the movie but it took forever to start and it went on for three or four months in the desert and i got sick everybody got sick but the movie was in the can and i was broke again so another movie came up i don't know what the hell it was but I wasn't getting any place. Electric Light and Blue.
No money. No money. I think I got $20,000 for electric light and blue. And uh, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do because I had to get I had to get ahead financially. I couldn't I couldn't stay in debt. So uh, Michael Eisner, who was an executive at uh, ABC, he saw electric light and blue and he said I want that guy in a cop show I don't care what it is we'll sign him for 13 episodes without a pilot I want him in the audience is going to love him the little guy with the big muscles on a motorcycle put it together so I hired um, a manager. Now I never was emotionally healthy enough to get a good agent or a good manager. I must have gone through dozens of them. And uh, I always made trouble for myself. You got to recognize uh, while I'm still alive, because when I'm dead, They'll be just talking about it. You got to recognize that I'm very, very, very self-destructive. I'll do one great thing for myself and then a dozen terrible things for myself. So anyway, I hired this manager and I said, Eisner's going to give me 13 episodes. Go make the best deal you can. So he makes a deal at Universal. Now, what was this episode supposed to be about? Beretta. We're getting there. He makes a deal for 13 episodes at Universal. And they had a series there that they had just canceled about a cop. Toma. And I saw some of the episodes of Toma and I said, with all due respect, I can write better than that if I hold a pencil with my butt. So I don't want to do Toma. And they said, well, how about just doing the disguises? So there was a uh, a script floating around there called Tony Beretta 609 and I don't know what the hell it was but it wasn't that great but the guy who wrote it was going to do the show but fortunately Jim Garner had done a pilot there of whatever the hell the name of it was. He was a private detective. Uh, and it had just hit. So he had 24 episodes on the air. And the writer, Stephen Cannell, was, said, I'm too busy to do Beretta. I got to get 24 episodes on the air. And I said, well, be my guest. I'll see you later. So we got rid of him. So I went to my old friend, my old dear friend, Bernie Kowalski, who I had done a half a dozen cowboy shows with on television, the cheap cowboy shows, those half hour junk shows, you know, uh, Lone Ranger and God knows what they were. You get $500 and you have to fall off the horse three times and then you get paid. Anyway, I called Bernie Kowalski who was a pretty successful director by then. I said, Bernie, I need a favor. You gotta come over here and help me put this thing together. And uh, so we wrote the script, essentially both of us wrote the first episode together.